Good evening. Nice to see you all. Thank you all for coming out on this rainy night. I'm glad it's not a blizzard. Um, how many of you are here for the dedication of the Sturgeon mural? Oh, look at that. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Dave Hurley. I don't have the white van that says Hurley painting. <laughs> but my brother John has received a lot of compliments for painting a giant chicken and a sturgeon. And he's a very modest guy. He just says thank you. <laughs> so I want to thank the uh, Bay View Point Center for um, you know letting us use the space tonight. Uh, Karen and Kenna for helping to set up. Um, our wonderful guitarist Will Brown. Uh, Ned Leitner, the one-man uh, television station, is <laughs> videotaping. It's going to be on the Belfast uh, TV station, and it'll also be available as a download to share with friends. Um, I want to thank the uh, Belfast Community Co-op for uh, providing the funding for this evening. Um, when I first met with Jamie Cermak right down where the um, mural was before it was painted. And he was just so enthusiastic about it. I, I couldn't remember what he said. I said, can you remember the quote? So I'm proud that we can, that we can continue to honor and acknowledge the original people who stewarded the special place long ago. Their stories and names are still active with us to this day. So um, the Sturgeon now has a, a name. It's uh, Sturgeon Summer 2023, because you might have noticed last summer, all of a sudden, there was Sturgeon in the news on Facebook. So I, I think it was, it was timely that the, I don't know whether the fish create the mural or what was. Um, So the, the space underneath the deck seemed like a wonderful place to paint a mural. And uh, when I first met with James, he said, well, why do you want to paint this? And I said, well, I'm an artist. I think it would be fun to paint a giant sturgeon. And I had some questions about the, uh, you know, the place named Pasagasawak Yig. So I just moved here 43 years ago. <laughs> but the name has always been here. You know, the name was always here. So I was just fascinated about the name. Um, so that was one of the questions. And then the other part was to get some information that would go on the display panel um, that will include cultural and scientific information. So that, that's the next part of this. And because of the flooding that we had, the um, panel will be about 50 feet from the harbor walk. So it'll be safe. Um, I also want to, uh, we have a special guest this evening. Jennifer Neptune is a leader within the Penobscot tribal community, as well as being a superb indigenous artist, weaving baskets, doing elaborate beadwork. She works closely with the Hudson Museum at the University of Maine and has led the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. She's also the wife of James Francis. So thank you so much for coming down and having dinner with some friends. So our guest speaker, James, is also an amazing artist. Uh, he's currently working on a tile installation for the floor of the Northern Woods Monument uh, Visitor Center. It's about 230 tiles that are four foot square. It's all etched. I'm not going to tell you what, what the design is, but when you go there and you walk on it, you'll agree that great art not only deserves to be on a ceiling, but also a floor that you can walk upon. Um, so, if James was an Italian in the 15th century, we would call him a Renaissance man. If he was Jewish, we would honor him by calling him a mensch. Um, he's able to connect geology geography, mythology, and his own personal narrative to help us see the landscape of Maine with new eyes. Um, 
So thank you so much. Let's give a big welcome to James Francis. Um, thank you, David. Thank you for, um, well, first embarrassing my wife, I'm sure. And then um, embarrassing me, I'm very too kind, too kind, sir. Um, I, I didn't, you guys are staring at one picture and I wanted to put something up there. Um, now if I can get it back to where it needs to be. Yay. It's hot. So I usually just like to dive in. When are you going to come down? When are you going to land? I should have stayed on the farm. I should have listened to my old man. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, it's a song. It's the opening verse for Goodbye Yellow Brick Road by Elton John, Sir Elton John. Have you ever had one of those songs that when it comes on the radio or you hear it, it transports you back in time to a, an event or a place or even a person, maybe that first kiss or whatever it may be. For me, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road transports me back till I was, I was four years old. And we were crossing Tobin Bridge in Boston. It was nighttime. My mother had gathered my older brother Jojo, my younger sister Renee, and myself, and put us in a little panel truck, a little moving van in Fall River, Massachusetts, and she headed north. She had found out my father was cheating on her, and she was leaving him. And I don't know what happened in that panel van that night. That song must have came on the radio. She turned it up, because when I hear, you know you can't hold me forever, I see her lips singing it with the skyline of Boston beyond her and the girders of Tobin Bridge going by. Now, I've lived with this memory my whole life. Never bought that. I, don't, I won't buy the CD. I won't download it on Spotify or whatever the kids do these days. I just let it come to me when it comes to me. And I've, I've found over time that this is a really special gift because it was that trip was the first time I ever went home. It was the first time... I was born in southern New England. It's the first time I went to the reservation. And by the next morning, we were pulling into my grandmother's house, a place where I grew up for many years, a place that sits on top of Oak Hill on Indian Island near Old Town, Maine. Now, there's a little irony to this little story at the beginning. You know, that little moving truck that my mother packed us up all in, it was a Mayflower moving van. <laughs> and so there's... I don't know what that means, but uh, ironic. <laughs> so I grew up on this small island adjacent to Old Town. That's my mom, and if you look down in the corner, you can see my grandmother. So I went to Old Town High School. I was a runner when I was a youth, and I ran for Old Town High, high School. And uh, after high school, I joined the Air Force. And... First, they shipped me to Texas, which in April was pretty hot. And then on to Cheyenne, Wyoming, where I spent four years. Has anybody been to Cheyenne, Wyoming? Yeah. Alien landscape. It's um, a little different than here. In fact, I, um, <laughs> I got married when I was in the Air Force to a local Cheyenne girl. And she came back to Maine and actually felt claustrophobic just too much, too, ma too many trees. Because out there you can see the Rocky Mountains 50 miles away. You can see horizon. 
You know, here you can barely see out of your yards in some cases. And so it's just a vastly different landscape. And it was while I was there, I, I, I got homesick. And I, I wasn't homesick for, you know, my grandmother or my mother who, ra who raised me, or even my brother. I was, I was more homesick for the landscape. I grew up on, on an island in the river. And that was something that, you know, this type of feeling, you know, this is just north of um, you know, where I grew up. So in the Air Force, right towards the end, um, they ask you the question, are you going to re-enlist? You know, or are we going to get you again for another four years is what I heard. But um, my, my grandmother was sick. And I had come home and asked for her counsel. And she was dying of cancer in the hospital. And she reminded me of a relationship that I had in the community with, with some elders. I had gone and knocked on an elder's door when I was 10 and asked a question about something in the community. And um, I was curious about her history. And that changed my relationship with this group of elders, and they taught me things. And my grandmother reminded me of that. Um, and that said I had been given a, a gift. She, she said I had been given a gift, and I had to learn how to give back. And, and when she told me that when I was a young 22-year-old person, the only gift that I could remember her giving me, I thought it was a gift she had given me, was when I was... Um, when I was 13, now, I, my brother is a couple years older than me, and when I was young, I skipped a grade, and they moved me up. And my brother stayed back in the eighth grade. And so I had the lovely experience of going to high school with my older brother. Yeah, lots of fun. Um, but my grandmother, for my 13th birthday, got me a pair of Spider-Man underoos. <laughs> and if you don't know what Spider-Man underoos are, they're a top and a bottom, and they got, you know, some design on it, and which was fine. I mean, God bless my grandmother, really. But my brother was there. And so we'd be standing around before school. Mind you, I'm a freshman in high school. And he'd look me up and down, and we're standing with all the friends. He's like, what's up, Spidey? So we start. But, but in actuality, that relationship with those elders is what the gift that she thought I needed to give back. So I didn't enlist, re-enlist, I came home. I packed up my little car and drove across the country from Wyoming to uh, Maine and um, went to college. And I wanted to become a historian. So I matriculated at the University of Maine, and, and they don't offer these on the reservation, so I had to take some Native American studies classes at university, You're just general. And I learned about the Trail of Tears, this forcible removal of the Cherokee Nation from their homeland in Georgia and the Carolinas to some alien landscape. And as I was walking across campus on that day, I had a lot of admiration for all of these tribes, the Cherokee and the Choctaw and these this numerous tribes. I had a lot of admiration because they're still here today. They survived that. How did they know where fresh water was in that new place? How did they know those red berries were edible? They had no knowledge of that place. Where they left, they had generations upon generations upon generations of knowledge. And as I was walking across the campus of the University of Maine thinking about this, I see this big pine tree up on hilltop. That's where all the dorms are. That's where I was going. Going to get my nap in after history class. Pine combs on the ground. And I realized that that pine tree is the descendant of the same pine trees that my ancestors dealt with. And that squirrel's a descendant 
of the squirrels that my ancestors dealt with. Because we as a tribe have never been forcibly removed. We're in our homeland. Changed my life. That in that moment, it changed how I thought. It changed, turned around, walked back down over the hill, not taking a nap today, and changed the classes I took. So geology of Maine, you know, uh, literature in Maine, anything I could get a hold of that was going to tell me about this place I wanted to know. S things I read. Started reading Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau comes here in 1846. It's the year he climbed Katahdin. 1857, that's when he hunts the moose. And then, that's 1853, he hunts the moose. In 1857, he goes on his longest journey with Joe Polis. And one of the things that he did in the Maine woods was he compiles a list in the back of the book of some aboriginal words, he may have called them, but Penobscot words for trees, for plant, um, other plants and animals, but also place names. And this kind of intrigued me a little bit. And I was looking through his, his journals. So when the Maine Woods was published, it was actually published as three different articles. And then later it was made into a book collectively called the Maine Woods. And because of that, his journals don't include stuff that made it into those articles, but you can find the dates and look in the journals and read. Like it, in 53, he goes to Indian Island, and in the Maine Woods he was visiting with, um, with somebody, and then he mentions that he goes out back and a couple of fellas were making a birch bark canoe. Well, let's look in the journal, he goes into five pages of detail about that canoe. And it's just like this wonderful thing. But in that journal, he says, the Indian stood nearer to wild nature than we, the wildest and the noblest quadrupeds, even the largest freshwater fishes, some of the wildest and the noblest birds, and even the fairest flowers have actually receded as we advance, and we have but the most distant knowledge of them. It was a new light when my guides gave me Indian names for things which I had only scientific ones before. In proportion, as I understand the language, I saw them from a new point of view. I'm a historian. I'm going to share some. Joseph Antian is probably my favorite historic figure in our Penobscot history. Just because he embodies so much of who, who we are and who we've become. He was born on Christmas Day in 1829, and we've been, we're a very Christian tribe. Um, in fact, St. Anne's Church in our community is one of the longest continuously operating sites of worship in this country. I think it's like top five or somewhere there. Joseph Antian also dies, a hero, main he a hero in Maine history, on the 4th of July in 1870. And we're a very patriotic tribe. He dies at these falls that you see here. He dies on a log drive on Independence Day because other people were gone. They had a skeleton crew and an inexperienced bowman in the boat. Couldn't get the boat around in time, and they hit a rock broadside, and the water starts tearing the boat apart. It's an interesting part of the river that don't paddle much because there was a, a nice, convenient portage, but you can't portage logs. Logs have to run the length of the river. Joseph Antian's father was our chief, a sagam, in the hereditary era, which meant he was chief for life. And when he died, the state of Maine intervened and said, you must have an election. It's more civilized. You must have an election. So we switched to an elective system. 
Joseph Adetian would have been the next chief if we went with the hereditary system, but he was also the first elected. So he has this distinction. He, he straddles that, um, that place. Joe Polis, um, in 1857, Henry David Thoreau hires him from Polis's front yard in a house that still stands on Indian Island. Polis was in his flower garden. Sounds very cosmopolitan. To, a flower garden, and he was he was skinning a deer hide. How's that for a juxtaposition? I'm skinning my deer hide in the flower garden, but he hires him uh, to take him on this epic journey, which you know starts in Bangor and overland to Green uh, Green Greenville, up Moosehead Lake in a canoe, um, into the Penobscot up into the Allagash, down the east branch of the Penobscot, all the way back to Old Town. A journey that a group of us did in 2014 that took us 16 days. It took Polis and, uh, Polis and uh, Thoreau 13. All that journey, and as they were coming close to uh, Indian Island, coming back to where he had hired him, uh, for just after Pol Polis teaches Thoreau how to paddle a canoe. I mean, they're at the end of this trip, and he's just then teaching him how to paddle a canoe. Um, but he asked him, aren't you, aren't you glad to be home? And Polis you know, basically tells him, it makes no difference where I'm at, because he was always at home. It didn't matter to him where he was. So Thoreau was a, a big... Per, uh, person for me in um, identifying through him, but from his guides, um, Penobscot place names on the route that he was on. One earlier source was um, Old John Neptune. So Old John Neptune, who was the vice chief to Atian's um, father, John so it was John Neptune, vice chief, and John Antian, the chief. Uh, he was also a guide, and he guided a state official named Joseph Treat, who did a survey of the new state of Maine in 1820. And from this, is uh, these journals are a um, number of maps, and it's interesting because it's like a snapshot because he actually puts little triangles on the map where Indians are encamping on the river and uh, also writing phonetically some of the Indian place names. And then there was Fanny. Fanny Hardy X. Storm is, a, I'm going to use the air quotes, a historian um, from Brewer. And I use the air quotes on her um, because people, you know, she, she learned her stories from her father and her father's company, uh, father was Manly Hardy, and he was a fur dealer and uh, did a lot of trapping himself. But he had a lot of Native Americans coming through the house, and they would sit around. Old John Neptune and him would sit by the fires uh, hours on end in the, in the parlor and talk into the night. And she were listening to these stories and, like, taking them down. And so, but some historians scoff at her, let's not hearsay. But she wrote this book called Indian Place Names of the Penobscot Valley in the Coast of Maine. And the way she does history, that's the way we did history. It was oral. It was passed down from, you know, through the, we didn't write it down. But she wrote this in the introduction to her book on place names. She goes, the day is past when our Indian names were the butt of foolish laughter to be distorted, mutilated, displaced by trivial appellations all Indian place names had a local pertinency in recovering the meaning in the correct form of the names we enlarge our horizons and make home a more romantic place to live in. These old names are the colored curtains which hang beside the windows through which we look back into the beginning of humans living here. For ages upon ages, countless human beings have lived and toiled and suffered here and we have left only these names. Well, I don't agree with that last part, but. Colored curtains. 
When I started studying, I, um, I considered them, it was like I was looking through a window into the past of how my ancestors saw the landscape, because that's what I was getting. I was understanding it, it differently. And those elders that I would go see as a youngster would, you know, one of them told me about language. They said, you know, to truly understand language, you have to understand the culture. And to understand the culture, you have to understand the language. And she used to talk about the predictability of culture and language. And um, this little game, if you guys are, do you want to play a little game? Just take a couple minutes. And it requires a little bit of math, but um, I want you all to keep this to yourself. I always have one. Um, so pick a number between two and nine, okay? Multiply that number by nine. Now you all should have a two digit number. Add those digits together. Subtract five. So you all should have a number now, each number that you have corresponds to a letter, like A1, B2, C3, D4, E5, all the way to Z26. Now, with that letter that you got from your number, think of a country that begins with that letter. Now, with the last letter of that country, think of an animal. And with the last letter of that animal, think of a color. Everybody got? All right. So I want a show of hands. How many people have orange kangaroos from Denmark? <laughs> Am I magic? No. No, predictable. First of all, the math is all a ruse. I all, nine, is, nine is somehow magic or something, but I got you all back to four if you did the math right. No matter what number you picked at the beginning, you were back at four. And then if you know enough about the U.S. education system, with most of us were educated in, our brains, when you say country, our brains go to Europe. And we go, what's here? Oh, there's Denmark. And then kangaroo and orange just, there's just so many. Sometimes you get an aqua koala. Anybody get an aqua koala from Denmark <laughs> back there? Yeah, see, sometimes. But, yeah, that's fine. You guys are good. This, that was a good show of hands. Yeah. All right. So as I progressed and um, as a historian, I, 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 st I started really be becoming a, a geographer, a cultural geographer, and I was reading things like Carl Sauer, if you know who he is, and... This guy, Yifu Tuan, he's a, a Chinese cultural geographer. And he formulated this very simple thing. He says space and area plus culture equals place. So when you're talking about a sense of place, it's an area filtered through people or the, the peopleness of that place. The culture helps define the place. But this, this is a formula. And we can mess with this. So we can take, like, the space, say, let's say the Penobscot River Valley. That's our space that we're going to deal with. And if we define it by the current culture, you know, uh, Western science, Maine, American culture, we're going to talk about log drives. We're going to talk about dams. We're going to talk about pollution. We're going to talk about river cleanup, river restoration, dam removal even sturgeons, three-foot sturgeons, that swim under kayakers out here. That's the story we're going to tell, because that's our culture that we live in today. That's how we're going to frame the story of this river. But what if we were to tweak that? What if we were to take the cultural piece, and I'm going to say reinsert an indigenous culture, a Penobscot culture, into that cultural piece. We're going to get a different sense of what this river means, the history of this river, even the, how this river was created. It's just 
a simple little tweak. This is where we're going. It's how we spell Katahdin in our language. Anybody know what Katahdin means? Yeah, he's, it means greatest mountain. Yeah, greatest mountain. Does that make sense? Yeah, why? Why does it make sense? It's the biggest mountain where? It's the biggest mountain in Maine. So, I've got an ancient name here, Katahdin, which was probably named a long time ago, way before there was a Maine, okay? So this whole idea that we named it because it's, you know, tall, and, and even just across the border in New Hampshire, Mount Washington is taller, right? Plus, okay, imagine, if you will, you're a Penobscot, and you're canoeing in your birch bark canoe, and you're in this pond right here. This is Compass Pond. It's next to River Pond, which connects through Puckawakam Stream to the river. And you're paddling through here one day. Two weeks later, if you can get there that fast, you're strolling by Mount Washington. How are you going to know which one was taller? You're not, right? So the idea that this is the biggest is almost a misnomer, but the greatest mountain, I don't know, we have like stories where Gluskop, the, who taught us our cultural teachings, when he was done, he gets in his canoe and he paddles north and this becomes his lodge and him and his family are in there making arrowheads for a war that is yet to be fought. So it's a pretty sacred mountain in that aspect according to oral traditions. But I don't know why it's called greatest mountain. I mean, I can feel it when I'm there. When I took this picture, if you've ever been to Katahdin, it draws your eye. It captures you. It's like one of those places on the planet, like Sedona doesn't do that to me, but some people say like Sedona, and there's, there's a couple other places. But for me, um, that's what makes this great. Just didn't. So through the years, as I've been studying place names, um, they fell into a few categories, which, you know, a geologic or geographic description. I have a picture of a canoe I drew here because those geologic and geographic descriptions are basically road signs because we are mobile people that like the culture today, but we like the coast in the summer. And we like the coast in the summer because nice breeze, and who, who doesn't like the coast in the summer? And plus there was plenty of shellfish, plenty of shellfish. How many of you who live down here on the coast know where there's a shell midden? I mean, a lot of people, right? A lot of food down here don't want to be here in the winter. Actually, where would we go in the winter? Actually, what would happen is in the fall, you would gather together with your family and you would go to a hunting ground that has always been in your family. It would spread out on the landscape and our family groups. Some families travel in 100, 120 looks upriver. every year, spread out. Caring capacity of the land couldn't feed all of us in this room if we all lived in the same spot. Soil's not good enough for agriculture, not to the scale that we would need to all live in the same spot, so we spread out. Now what does that do? Generation after generation after generation you start to know this whole watershed, like the back of your hand, because you're traveling it, and the adjacent watersheds, and those portages that carry you from one to the other. So this geologic and geographic description becomes really important for that piece. Some names are natural resource-based. Going up Birch Stream, 
going to Hemlock Island, going to the Birch Islands, going to Oak Hill. Sometimes they're even land use. The place where we skinned hides. Or, hmm, oh, the place where we speared sturgeon. So there's often that component, place where we got fish. There's all kinds of land use out there that we see. And sometimes there are legends, stories in our culture that are geo-referenced. So this is Old Town here at the bottom. Uh, I just wanted to point out where the dam is in Old Town, there's a restaurant there called Pepper's Landing today. Um, that was actually the site of the village in the area that was adjacent to the falls. Indian Island is where the reservation actually starts, and the reservation is 220 some odd islands in the Penobscot River, stretching north from Indian Island all the way to Nicotau. Nicotau means the fork between the east branch and the west branch. These branches go up and hug Katahdin, east branch to the east and to the north, west branch to the south and to the west, embracing that. Indian Island has a, a modern name today. We call it Al Nabe Menahan. Al Nabe just means the people's island. And it wasn't, um, we think that's post contact. Now, the island above it, we call Orson Island today, was known as Kachi Mugawag Menahan, which means Big Bog Island. And I got a camp on this island. My Uncle Neil built a camp there in the 80s, and I spent a lot of time with him. And um, there's not a big bog on the island. And it really bothered me for a long time. I was like, yeah, but that, and he's like, yeah, the bog. And I go over there, and it's, it's not that big. And I'm like, mm, it's kachi. Word kachi is like immense, like big, big bog island. And then one day I was sitting around and looking at a map in my studio, and I realized just north of the top of that island is a stream called Birch Stream. And Birch Stream goes right through Elton Bog, the biggest bog in the state of Maine. Now, if you're traveling in the river, you're not going to know that that bog's up there unless there's something in the river that's named that's going to point you to it. Just below that, you see an airport, and you see like Qualbuck. It says Qualbuck. It's a longer word. And as I said, my Uncle Neil used to live up there. And he used to, the old train track that went across the island, and he used to travel that, and he'd paddle across to the airport. And um, he'd go to a little cafe that my parents were running on the reservation, have coffee. And my uncle liked to talk a lot, a lot. <laughs> His best friend was my wife's father. It was, they were grumpy old men here in the last few years. But um, I, was, I had these, always had these maps, and I was always updating them. They were hand-drawn, and I was putting place names in places, and I wrote for this little piece of the river called Qualbuck. Um, I wrote that, that Carol had told me, our language master, something about a dance. We have a tutu was. You play this song, and it used to be played on a piece of bark, and you used to try to make, you stand up pine needles on it, and as you hit the bark, the pine needles would spin and sometimes fall. And the guy who was singing the song would be singing for the, the women and the girls and try to get them to spin and turn or fall, trying to get them to mimic. The song always was kind of different according to what was going on. So it was like commands in the song, kind of like, was that square dancing or something? But um, she goes, oh, it's like that command in Tutu was, and it meant to turn and spin. And so I like wrote it down, and my uncle came in and tapping on my map. He goes, that, that makes sense. I was like, hey, why does that make sense? Because I was baffled. He goes, oh, that piece of river, because this land at the bottom is an island, that big island, letter C there. We're at the top of that.
That little section is all we're talking about. He says, when there's a freshet, when there's a flood, the water flows towards the west. But normally, it flows towards the east. And then I went and did some research before they put the dam in, and there was actually a falls there, a, a reversing falls, or a place where the river turns back upon itself. So Carol recognized the turn back, turn around piece uh, in the word. Uh, had nothing to do with the dance, but it's telling us where the river turns back upon itself. And I tell the story because it's important about field work. It's about <clears throat> not just decoding what this word means, it's about going out there and witnessing it or knowing it, understanding it. So down at the bottom of this island is uh, Orono, where the, the still water goes back into uh, the Penobscot. So um, kind of a very interesting piece of history here. So this is Marsh Island. You can see Orson Island at the top, Big Bog Island. Uh, you can see Indian Island over there, kind of in the, in the, the pit of the two islands. And then you see the main stem of the Penobscot River on the right, and then the Stillwater River. Well, isn't that a geographical um, oddity? You see this stream? Where that stream meets the Penobscot River is the start of the Stillwater River. And it ends down there at Basin Mills where the star is. That is the extent of what the state calls the Stillwater River. Now this comes to be because in the Treaty of 1818 with Massachusetts, it defines all the islands in the Penobscot River from Old Town Island north. Well, what's Old Town Island? Is it Marsh Island where the town of Old Town is on? Or are you talking about Indian Island? And so this debate was like kind of brewing. And there were petitions to the state about you know, Old Town Island. And in fact, Old Town took out a lease, a 100-year lease to ha with the tribe to have their town there. We had a, uh, we had a, a rowdy um, elder in our community many years ago went over to evict them. She had a root club and a... Um, <laughs> I mean, legally, if they had a lease. Anyways, so the state uh, decides to rename that little channel the Stillwater River because, oh, now, guess what? Marsh Island is not an island in the Penobscot River. So it comes off the table. And the really bad thing is Stillwater, you know where they get that? That was our ancient name for it. It meant Stillwater, it meant flat water. So they took our name which is kind of still there in spirit, because it means the same thing. Yeah, fun stuff. All right, we're, we're at the bottom. We're at Basin Mills at the bottom. This is the still water coming back into the Penobscot. Now, Fanny always talked about understanding place names. It's best from an upriver perspective. So you're in a canoe. You're going upriver, and then when you come to the sloping ledge, which you'll see if you're going in that direction, you'll know you're at Sawadabskuk, which means at the sloping ledge. So I knew this, and I was poking around in this area, and I realized that there's a massive set of falls at the end of the Stillwater as it tumbles down into the main branch of the river. And I was like, why would they call this Stillwater? Why? And so a lot of research went into very particular, granular, de de detailed research on what the place names were here. And so what we have is this place where the river forms a channel, which is below Ayers Island. And Ayers Island is the first island in the river after Verona. So where the river forms a channel, and they're talking about the channel around Ant Hill Island there, And from that point, you can see, hear, and feel the falls that are coming up, the Ayers Falls or Alewives Fisheries. You can feel them. This is a pretty massive set of falls. Even today, they had the Whitewater Nationals 
through through that set of falls. So going left is uh, is you know where the river forms a channel. That channel is being pointed out for a reason. You take the channel, and then you would portage, carrying place ac across that peninsula. And by doing so, you're you're walking right pat right by Pat's Pizza, and um, you know Margarita's there in downtown Orono, and you put in above the falls on the Stillwater. Now what this does is makes you go up the flat water. Now the reason why this is important because if you go up the main stem of the river, there are some obstacles. When you get to um, this elbow here where there's a, an M, there's a set of falls that in our language means bad falls at the site of a bad carry. Fun. Marsh Island means slippery ledge island or slippery rock island. All the rocks on the shore around this part of the river, I don't care what the temperature is, what time of year, whether they're wet or dry, are slippery, like it, inevitably. And, it's, and if you're trying to carry a boat over it, no fun. And then later, you got to get around shad rips, and there's just obstacle after obstacle. There's even one called Slippery Ledge Falls where it's so shallow um, you can't even get a bite with your paddle to paddle up it. Too slippery to pull up. And so there's just a variety. So you would take the route up to Stillwater and get above all the falls in Old Town. Everything I just taught you we figured out by understanding what the place names meant. Pasadumkeg, Basadumkik, Basadumkik. Means above the gravel bar. If you've ever paddled this part of the river, it's probably at most a foot deep if you're lucky. When we paddled down from Pasadumkeg, we, we paddled this several times each summer and those first few paddles, you actually have to find the river in the river because you paddle, you gotta find where the water is going and it's different all the time because it's a big shifting gravel bar. And that gravel, gravel's coming from east of the river. There's glacial moraines and eskers that are eroding and going into the river. And a stream can carry sands and gravels, but when it hits the river, it falls out, becomes this big gravel bar extremely identifiable. And this is interesting because to think about this culturally, so it's a gravel bar. So it's not only something that you're going to visually see and be like a, like a travel marker for you, but it's also a place you can go stick sticks in the gravel and collect stones and make a weir to trap fish. I don't know if you can see number five on there, it says Okwajis. And there was an ancient zigzag pattern of rocks. You can still see pieces of it today if the water level's just right. Um, but this was maintained for generations. This was a massive fishing place. And it wasn't that they were trapping all the fish, they just were putting passages for the fish at very prescribed places where you'd be there with your spear and you collect them and put them in your canoe or sometimes it even like set their canoe up broadside on the river and get a piece of birch bark and the fish would go up the birch bark and land in the boat and be trapped. It was ingenious. But when those fish are running, it's... Um, yeah, it's important for you to get them while they're there. I mean, Blackman Stream means plenty of alewives stream. So a certain for Matamis Contis. You see that on the signs going up the interstate by Lincoln. But this isn't Bradley. So we had more than one Matamis Contis. It's not like, oh, we can't call it that. We already have one. No, it's more important to say, hey, there's a lot of alewives that come there. Is um, fishing by spears, weirs, and nets. Um, 
Down here is Old Lemon Island, or Lamon. And it means um, Island of the Red Clay Quarry. It's actually the stream of the Red Clay Quarry. The island's just at the mouth of it. And this harkens back to our connection to our ancestors, the Red Paint people. We have this important clay that was in our culture that our ancestors used to bury the dead in. But the state archaeologists like to say, well, that ain't you guys. You guys don't bury your dead there, so that ain't you. Okay. So there's something called cultural affiliation. The state archaeologist says that we can only claim, if, if we dug outside today and we found a, a indigenous skeleton out under the parking lot, for some reason we're digging, and it was 900 years old, then the tribe could come in and say something about those remains. But if it was 1,001 years before today, then we would have zero say on it because the state says, oh, well, that ain't you. Which has caused a lot of problems. This is, this is our homeland. And, you know, when you think about, think about this place, think about Maine. 13,000 years ago, we got two miles thick of ice. Probably nobody living where the ice is. Go to Greenland, you'll see indigenous cultures living on the fringes of those glaciers. We were probably doing the same. George's Bank was an island. We were probably on that. And as the glacier recedes, tundra, land is tundra, and there's mammoth and giant sloths and other megafauna, as they call them. We hunted them caribou. Then for a while, because the, you're releasing all that water, the sea's going to rise, and the land hasn't rebounded from the weight of the glacier yet, and we get an inland sea. If you dig anywhere between here and Mount Katahdin, you're going to hit about six feet thick of clay, marine clay, because it was an inland sea for a while. And then the forest changes hardwoods, and then birches, and then the boreal forest we have today. And for a group of people who lived in those environments, we better have adapted and evolved to those changes as they came. And it's exactly those changes and those evolutions that Science looks at it and says, well, that ain't you. Well, it is. Uh, one more. Uh, so number 12 is what we call Sugar Island today. Um, and it actually meant Sugar, sugar Plum Island. And the Sugar Plum is uh, the fruit of what we call the service berry bush. Very sweet little. And it, ha and it has another name. It's uh, Shad Bush. Yeah, and on the western end of this island, there was this, these shad trees, shad bush. And the um, reason why they're called shad is because they are um, fairly early bloomers in the spring, and they, they're white. There's white flowers, tree of white flowers, and um, it's right when the shad are running. Shad bush. And... Especially when you, when you think about the Penobscot calendar and, you know, the, the, the moon right before that is the moon where um, we find a little food grudgingly. It's like starving times. And then in the next moon, you have this glorious white plant that shows up. And it's like, oh, the fish are coming. We better get a little further upriver and get to our weirs and get ready. It becomes this beacon in the landscape, this one plant. Um, That's a guess of walk egg, is that right? Besa just Jennifer, you know? It sounds good to you, thank you. The place of, first of all. Keg is a locative. Whenever you see keg, it just means at the place. Just a locative. 
put that in front of whatever you're going to say. And this means at the place where they speared sturgeon by torchlight. But this place in general here meant um, a far off dark forest or dark forest. Yeah. Jennifer, do you know what it, uh, David knows? A, a, dark, a dark forest. So it has both kind of connotations. It's the, the river itself is, has to do with the spearing and the sturgeon. And, and we, we did this because the sturgeon had these bony plates. And if you, they're curious and they'll come up to the light at night and they'll ex expose their bellies and you can with our spears. The hunks and the cooks. These are endings to words. I think there's a joke there, but I, my wife keeps telling me that, no, there's not a joke there. <laughs> um, and I think that becomes the joke. Um, so hunks and the cook. So a hunk sound, a very harsh sounding sound, it, it means non-canoeable, like Nassauwita hunk stream. is the stream that flows between the mountains. That's what it means. And Nassauwita hunk, makes its way down over granite, polishing it, and people actually slide down it. If you've ever been in that part of Baxter State Park and gone to Niagara Falls, you know you can get in the stream and like get on your bottom and slide down these rocks. It's quite, quite nice, quite refreshing. And cooks uh, mean very canoeable. The Sawadaps cook in Hamden if you paddle that all the way to Edna Pond and take a couple mile portage into Pleasant Lake, then you're in the Sabasta Cook. And if you take the Sabasta Cook down from there, you're at the Kennebec River. So you just jumped, like think of watersheds as a tree. Here's the Penobscot tree, here's the Kennebec tree, and that Sawadabs Cook is a branch of the tree, and the Sabasta Cook's another. And they get close, but they never touch. And doing that two-mile portage is like that squirrel jumping from one branch to another. But we've opened up a whole system of river to continue to paddle in. Those are the cooks. There's a, there's a story, a legend that comes out of um, Nassauwita Hunk. And um, it's about these two fishermen, two Penobscot fishermen. They got their sharpened stick in their trying to spear salmon. And nearby, the little people, Mecham West we call them, were sliding down the rocks, having a good time, playing. And those Penobscot fishermen spear that fish and they try to pull him in, but he's too heavy and he slides off their sharpened stick, and swims away with the puncture wound. So the little people with with their playfulness, comes over and teaches us how to make a fishing spear. A fishing spear that looks like this one in the picture that actually grabs the fish after you get it. I always thought this was interesting because we know exactly where this story took place and it always excited me. I was like, I can go to that place and convene with that story. And, and then I realized that, I said, whoa, whoa, they were fishing for salmon there. And this is a place that salmon, there's no way today the salmon can go that high in the river because of dams. Things like the, I don't even know what it's called, I call it the Mattasiunk Dam, very big dam between Mattawamkeg and Medway on the Penobscot River. Just below, just below what's called Salmon Stream, both today and in our language it was called Salmon Stream. And it was funny, I was reading an article about Salmon Stream from 1983, and the journalist was like, and the name's a misnomer. Jeez, there's no, just no salmon here. Well, no, because there's a big dam in the way. <laughs> and so just to get a little further, I, I, I called some people who knew this type of information about salmon habitat. I was like, what about that Salmon Stream? Is that good salmon? He's oh, the best. It's all like sands and gravel, perfect for them to put their you know, their eggs and all of that. So that's, again, that's a place name, Salmon Stream, Stillwater. 
um, Blue Hill across the bay. Those are names that I, I they're there in spirit. It's there. It's we think of it the same way in English as my ancestors thought about it. It's the Blue Hill that you can see from the bay. In closing, I'm going to talk about a story, a story of Gluskop and the moose. And moose is plural in this case, by the way. Or Gluskop and the Mises? No. So Gluskop was our cultural hero, and he did a lot of teachings. And one day he decided he was going to teach people how to hunt moose. And so they were, party was trompsing through the woods, and they come upon a large lake, and up the lake shore walks a cow moose and her calf. And Gluskop bends down, eyes never leading the cow or the calf, and he picks up a stone off the ground, he affixes it to a stick, notches it in a bow, and shoots the cow moose dead. Once the party got to the moose, who was huge to get the gift of meat, they realized she had been turned to stone, a mountain of stone. Today we know that as Mount Kineo on Moosehead Lake. Now, pretty fantastic story. Like almost like Medusa. Oh, the, the warriors are turning to stone. But the moose, she didn't turn into just any stone. She turned into that stone that Gluskop had picked up off the ground and it affixed to a stick. Kineo is one of the largest repositories for hundreds of miles for stone that is perfect for making tools and arrowheads. That's what the story is telling us. Because why? Why tell a story about a moose turning into stone if it doesn't have importance? So Kineo, Felsite, Rhyolite, they're all perfect for making stone. Now Gluskop had been readying a kettle to cook the moose in, and the calf moose is still alive. He just saw his mom get turned to stone, and he knocks over the kettle, and that becomes what we know of as Little Spencer Mountain. Historically, it was called Kettle Mountain. Um, in fact, the word Cocadjo, it's a little town up in that area, um, means we have the same root word for our word for kettle in our language. And then Gluskop takes off his backpack, and he throws it, and it becomes Big Spencer Mountain. So now we've got three mountains in the same region that, um, you know, are part of this story. And the moose starts running across the landscape, goes all the way to here, all the way to Penobscot Bay, and jumps over the bay to Dice Head. No, that was Gluskop. The moose is swimming, and Gluskop jumps over the bay and lands on Dice Head. Keep in mind, he has his dog in tow, and it's, he has his snowshoes on. And they say that he landed with such force at Dice Head that his snowshoes made imprints in the rocks. I went and checked it out. You have to, right? It's about that field work. So there's like stairs, you go past the lighthouse and you go down over the stairs at Dice Head. And quartz. Quartz plays an interesting piece to this story. But crisscrossed in quartz in the rocks are these patterns that, with a little imagination, you can see that these are, could have been made by snowshoes. People ask me, oh, do you, you took Maine geology, you, you know how this happened. Science, right? Not some story. Well, it really didn't matter which one I believe. I knew when I came down past that lighthouse down those stairs, I knew this is what they were talking about. It was that distinct a feature. 
And that's all that mattered. It was something that you could put your eyeballs on and use as a travel marker. So it was from this point that he gets the upper hand, shoots the moose whose rump becomes Cape Rozier across the way. We'll bring the map back. Cape Rozier. And he takes the liver and he throws it over an Egamogan reach. And he throws his, the entrails to the dog. Now, it's important. Culturally, you never feed your dog hand to mouth, first of all. So you always throw him his food. And they say you never feed a hunting dog the sweet meat of the kill because he'll lose his ability to scent. So you always feed him the entrails. So Gluskopf throws the entrails, which lands on that big Long Island, Osborough, that's in the middle. Yeah, lands on the shore of that. In fact, when we went out there to, to, to take some pictures, it was with Bill Haviland, an anthropologist friend of mine from Deer Isle. And he says, oh, you see, we're about 12 miles away. He goes, you see that across the bay, that white dot? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, we're going there. And I was like, oh, he's taking me to some rich guy's mansion. That's what it looked like. It was just this white dot across the bay. And as we got closer, it was this big quartz rock that you could see like a beacon from across the bay. And that is the entrails in the story that he threw to his dog. And the liver is unlike any other rock in Penobscot Bay. It's this reddish-brown rock, um, very different from the gray granite that's out there. So when you take these collectively, um, you start to see a pattern. A canoe, canoe route is laid out for you. Uh, dice head, which is some really dicey water. I mean, me and Jennifer had a chance to go out there last summer, and it was quite the adventure. Um, so you'd want to take that portage across Castine Neck. Um, yeah, that was an interesting. Where Castine Neck is, I don't know, do you guys see the pointer? No, you don't. Um, where Castine Neck is, it's the old name is Grassy Place where you would sit and wait. And I always thought that, oh, you're waiting for the high tide so you can go over the, ne over the, the neck to the other side because there's a big mud flat when it's not high tide. So I always thought that's all it meant. But when you go up to Fort Point, where Fort Point is up the bay here, that also has a name. It was a gathering place to wait. So you have these two places essentially across the river from each other, where you'd have to wait. And what you're waiting for is, if you're south and you're going up the river, you're waiting for the ingoing tide. And the same thing when you're coming down, you're waiting for the outgoing flow and the outgoing tide. Because to try, the waters that come out of the river at certain times, depending on the tide, are quite treacherous. And when you're in a little boat, it makes it hard. I'm not going to talk about the moons. <laughs> um, sorry. How are we on time, David? Great. I thought you were the clock master. 8.10. 8, yeah. Do you guys want to hear about the moon project? Yes. Okay. So 13 Moon Project was a drum project that was funded through the New England Foundation for the Arts. And I took 13 13-sided 13 drums. And, you know, my sense of place work in understanding this landscape isn't just about place names. It's also about other linguistic things like our lunar calendar. What, what, what do those mean? And um, we have names like when, the one in the middle, um, when ice forms on the margins of lakes and ponds. And it was during that moon that I kind of convened with nature and then came up with the image I, I wanted to paint. And so it was like a, a year long, like, hurry up and, well, <laughs> sit with it, sit with it, and then hurry up and paint. And, it, and I had to hurry up and paint because we had a community gathering at every new moon. So I had to bring, sometimes wet paint, bring these drums to show um, for, a, for a whole year. And um, so it just, 
goes to, it's just another one of those things where um, we're connecting to this space and really making it a Penobscot place by looking at these very narrow windows of time within the landscape. And so this started me thinking about um, going back in time through the landscape and doing um, these writings where I go to a certain place in the landscape during a certain time of the year and write a chapter of this story in that place. So if I'm going to write a chapter about March on the Pasadena River, I need to go there in March and understand that. And, and while I was there, I started to do time lapses with my camera because I was there. Um, and that's when I started doing a lot of some of the time lapses you saw earlier. Um, so I decided to start working on this weekly serial writings um, about place, time, distance, and worldview. Something I wrote but no one's ever read because part of it was it needed to be an oral story. It needed to be something that was told. Um, the geographic extent was the Penobscot watershed. Um, using space plus culture equals place, using um, seasonal round, what we were doing in certain seasons, place names, um, the moon systems, um, character development was a strict cultural lens. There's no dialogue in it because they would be speaking Penobscot and I would lose my audience. They wouldn't know what they were talking about. So what I, what I did was use the understandings of what the translations were and made them talk in that way. Like if they were saying they were going to come here, they would say, I'm going to the place where they speared sturgeon by torchlight. Um, so they interacted with, you know, through interactions with that environment, people, animals, landscape, time, distance, and cosmos. And also present it as a oral tradition. Um, this is the dam just, above, uh, just below where I live. So um, David had talked, and this is in closing, and then I'll take some. David had um, talked about this tile project that's in the, the new Katahdin Woods and Water National Monument that, um, that I'm working on the floor on, um, that my, uh, my wife wrote the content for. Um, and it got the name Dagaga Bimuk. So you're going to be hearing Dagaga Bimuk Visitor Contact Station. And Dagaga Bimuk, we were looking for a name that made sense, one, for where it was at, which was on Lookout Mountain. And this idea of Dagaga Bimuk is it's, um, it's a look. So when you have a a mobile culture that needs to convey travel. You have place names that have geographic descriptions, but you also have something called looks. So if I asked you to go to Old Town from here, from the, the point down here, uh, I may say go 12 looks. And you'd go down there and you'd look and how far can I see? And you'd go to that place. And then you get to that place and you'd look up river and you do that 12 times, maybe 100 feet, maybe four miles. Depends on what the look is, what, where you're at. But that look, that's the Gaga Bimuk, as far as one can see. And that's what we, and it, the, it sits on top of Lookout Mountain, so it's very appropriate. But it also is, um, yeah, I'm just going to go to questions. Are there any questions? And I'm, I'm not an encyclopedia. We do have place names, Matt, if you want to know what they all mean. Um, I'm going to start here, and then I'm going to go to, to the camera, the, the television station guy. Go ahead, over here first. Yeah, you. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's uh, there's a story of um, you know something holding back all the water, and um, we call it a frog monster. But some argue that it may have been ice, 
that released uh, the water. And through the story, creates the Penobscot River. Um, but there's also stories of the river flowing in the other direction, which now we know um, happened because of the what's happened here during glaciation. Uh, there are stories of the Isochino, which are frozen um, kind of monsters from the north. Um, the what? Shrinking the animals. Oh, shrinking the animals, yeah. So there's all these transformer tales about making the animals smaller. Um, that all, beavers used to be bigger. Um, and yeah, there's all kinds. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, you were talking about how the treaty had it that you owned all the islands that were uh, north of the, like, Marsh Island, maybe. But why didn't you own the islands all the way to the bay in the Penobscot River? Like, let's say, Seuss Island. Yeah, so, um, well, we did at one point. No, n not own. Right. Not own. You guys invented the word own, and then said, "Oh, since you don't know that, then we can take that." It's kind of how it went down. But anyways, um, no, it was a treaty with Massachusetts in 1818. So the the prior treaty um, had the same set of um, there was more islands, but also six miles on each side of the river going up the river. That was 1796 or something. But the Treaty of 1818 defined it as that. It also included in that 1818 um, like two acres in Brewer, which are who knows where those are at, and then um, what are called the four upper townships. So where Mattawamkeag, Maine is across the river in, um, I think it's called Wynn or uh, Woodville. Um, and where Millinocket is, and east of Millinocket, you'll still see it on the on maps. It's called Indian Purchase. Those four upper townships were set aside in 1818 for the tribe, and the first Maine state legislature they decided that native groups would be wards of the state, and they took over and put Indian agents in our communities, and then uh, proceeded to sell off those four upper towns. By 1833, they had sold off the four upper townships. And um, we call it a so-called sale, but um, yeah. So it was by treaty that it was like that. I'm getting a lot of questions about Sears Island, folks. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we, uh, all our land was significant to us. Um, this is, uh, mm. so it's, it's nice when I get a phone call and people want to know about cultural significance of a place because they want, want to protect it um, for whatever um, reasons that, that could be because I am certainly in that camp, you know, it's it's just like when we um, when I get the phone call to do, you know, yeah, the uh, my boss wants me to do a a land recognition. Oh, how's it going? Wow, can you help me with it? Well, no, because as Native people, we've been acknowledging for a long time that this is our land. You know, it's up to other people to acknowledge um, that it's our land, or at least our ancestral lands. But yes, there is cultural significance to that island. Um, whether it's going to be cultural significance that is enough to stop whatever development is uh, still being uh, looked at. And, um, you know, that island. Um, it was important to a group of natives who we talked about those family groups. There was a family group that went there. So 
I don't think we're going to find any temples or shrines on there to make it spiritual or anything, but um, it, they all have cultural significance. Yes. Yeah. I mean, every new moon, and there's roughly 12 or 13, depending. Um, usually we, we follow, it's 12, it's a cycle of 12, because it's roughly a month. Um, but every so often, if a certain moon falls on a certain calendar date, I think it's December 5th, if old moon follows... Um, I think it's before December 5th, then we have to insert this other moon, just called the inserted moon, which is like a leap year. What it'll do is kick the other moons back into place so we don't have a moon where the ice appears on the margins showing up in July eventually. Um, it's just a way to keep the moons uh, where they need to be. And there's, I do the calendar every year, and so it's, something that we just have to pay attention to. Um, and we have, we have ones that today have agriculture on them. So it's, it's kind of a, a calendar that's uh, both got traditional ones in it and also uh, agricultural ones in it. And um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me get comfortable. Um, no, I'm just going to. Um, so it all, one thing we have to remember is a few hundred years of contact here first with earlier fishermen and crowns um, before the United States even becomes United States. And they start dealing with what they deem as the Indian problem out west. So know that there's a, when you're talking about cowboys and Indians in the Wild West, that's way after we've had our, you know, fishermen and Indian story here. So um, by time the colonies are being developed, Massachusetts has already really dealt with their quote unquote Indian problem. We're kind of under their thumb, um, petitioning them. Um, and Maine just signs over on that. And Maine takes, considers us wards of the state starting in 1820, and that lasts until 76. Not 1876, 1976. You know, and within my lifetime, we had Indian agents in our community, which were state officials that were there to hold our purse strings. And money that we earned by having log drives down the river, using our islands for booms, um, leasing them. And then the reason why it ends in 1976 is because we seek federal recognition. So there's a distinction in this country that if you're working with the federal government, you have to be federally recognized. And that's a process you go through, you get approved federal recognition, and we needed to prove, we be in the Penobscots and the Passamaquoddies in the 1970s, we need to prove federal recognition because we were asking the federal government to sue the state of Maine on our behalf for two-thirds of the state of Maine. I was in junior high. So, when this was all going down. And so two-thirds of the state of Maine. And then that was, that's by colonial and like American. That was like title to the land. And so we used something called the 1792 Trade and Non-Intercourse Act, which was an act passed by Congress that says that any land that leaves 
the possession of a Native American group to anybody else, whether it's a state, a business, another person, has to be ratified by Congress. Two-thirds of the state of Maine left our position and went elsewhere, brokered by the state officials, and um, was not ratified by Congress. That was the impetus for the Maine Settlement uh, Claim, Land Claims Act. And part of that Land Claims Settlement Act stated that we as tribes would no longer be, even though we were federally recognized, would not be eligible for any federal laws that came down that were kind of blanket for all Native American tribes. So this takes place in 1980. And so in 1994 or so, when the Gaming Act gets passed, any state that already had gaming, tribes in those states can have gaming, uh, we were exempt. So we have to have lobbyists just to get us into bills when we find they're important for our communities because we're not covered in those. And all we have been asking the state of Maine is to renegotiate that piece so we can be on the same plane as all the other tribes um, in this country. This um, beautiful lady in the front row said it was sneakily snuck in there <laughs> at, at the last moment. Um, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> My wife. The <laughs> um, so, and that's kind of where we're at. And it, and it's you know there's this long history of tribal state relations where we were under the state's thumb and. People are like, oh, the Indians, we've got to take care of them. They're ungrateful. They're welfare cases. We were wealth. That was our money. In fact, Proctor Report in 1950, they do this report to look at the, the state of the, the tribes at that time. And Proctor does this report and unwittingly uncovers financial wrongdoing on the, state of the, on the part of the state with our funds. In fact, and then the state sneakily snuck that in where they would be exempt from, from that wrongdoing. And so there was a lot going on in 1980 and um, hastily trying to get the bill in um, when Carter was in his lame duck administration uh, led to a lot of these sneakily sneaky things that were happening. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> Yes. Would you like to talk about what you think would be fair reparations? Fair reparations, wow. Hmm. No, because I'm not sure what would be fair, really. Oh, you say, say, I say, okay, I want, you know, all this land back or, or what, whatever it may be. Um, you know, I. I don't think that's a, a, a question for me to answer. It's, it's, it's up to society in general. And I think we're on our way to answering those types of questions about how we want to deal with indigenous populations, not only in this state, but across this country and around the world. And you know, how does that, how, how do those things start? It starts by events like tonight. It starts by a decolonizing museum in Bar Harbor, the Abbey that's doing amazing things. It's, um, you know, Penobscot Nation um, working with Maine State Archives to um, get all those records from the Indian agents into our community so we can see what they say or our cultural heritage items that are in museums all over the world, which we're working to first get digital copies of and bring home and put in front of Penobscot people, but also Let's repatriate that stuff. Let's bring those wampum belts home because they're important to us. Let's take them off out of the back rooms and on the dusty shelves and bring them back where, um, I mean, they have a life. They have a, their beings. They, they need to be with their people. So I'm not, it's not anything that I'm going to, like, we need this back. I think that, you know, it's, 
I think that sovereignty is is the key today. That um, you know, follow what's going on in Augusta and where the Wabanaki Alliance is moving for Wabanaki sovereignty and the sovereignty for the tribes, and you know, vote vote the way um, you know that your conscience is going to carry you. But it's I'm not like an activist type. I'm not going to stand up here and pound my gavel, certainly. But, um, you know, I think my, my role is to talk about a landscape that we all live in, that we all travel in every day, and get you to think a little differently about it in an indigenous context and say, oh, you know, we, we do these trips to Sugar Island in the summertime, these, these cultural trips, paddle six miles to get there, and it's People can paddle birch bark canoe and have fun. And we had this guy who was there for like three days. And I had been talking all week about sense of place and we're talking about all kinds of place names and what it meant and just a really grounding experience of our connection to the landscape. And on the third or fourth day, he was like, yeah, but you guys didn't have like no sense of ownership. And I was like... See, and you all got quiet, and you're like, yeah, you didn't. No, but it's, that's, that is like Western thinking. That's that cultural piece that's like, oh, you got to have, you put a fence up, you own that much. When we're living in harmony with that landscape, and just because we're not planting a flag and saying we own this doesn't mean that people can just show up and take it away from you. Just because you have a, quote unquote, more sophisticated piece of paper that's going to give you title to it. So, you know, my job is to try to get people to think a little bit differently about, you know, how we as Penobscot people saw this place and hopefully give you a few tools about, um, you know, how you can see the, that a little differently. And um, you can contact the Penobscot Nation Museum. We have maps, place name maps. We should bring them to these. I know, what, why don't you bring them? <laughs> okay. She wouldn't even ride down here with me today. I had to ride by myself. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.